We've already talked on the Knife and Fork Show about how the FDA Food Safety Modernization Act, which was signed into law on January 4th, 2011, aggressively goes after the safety of imported foods, which account for roughly 20% of the food we eat in the United States. But it's not just about inspecting more food at the ports. One of the many requirements of FSMA was that FDA prepare a report suggesting a plan for helping foreign countries and food companies in foreign countries to better guarantee their products destined for the U.S. meet U.S. food safety standards. The FDA released that report. It was about 40 pages just a few weeks ago. It raises a number of issues. For starters, the FDA has a very limited budget, and so do many of these small develop country, developing countries that send us products. So how is FDA going to get more from these foreign countries without spending a lot more money itself? Also, where does this country get off telling other countries that their standards are not as good as those maintained by the U.S.? I have two guests here with me today to break this down. Jessica Wasserman is the president of Wasserman & Associates, a Washington, D.C. firm that specializes in global trade issues, especially as they relate to food regulation. Before she became a consultant, Jessica spent several years working at the USDA's Foreign Agricultural Service, and now she helps both importers and exporters. Also with me again is Amber Healy, who I have described as FCN's secret weapon because <laughs> she's capable of jumping on a multitude of topics. She recently studied and wrote on the FDA's Food Capacity Report for Food Chemical News. So Amber, open us up here. What's in this 40-page plan that we were talking about? Well, in the plan, it's, it's kind of more of an outline. FDA gives a lot of really great ideas about what it wants to do. It wants to do good things. It wants to help make the food not only coming into this country safer, but the food, in their rationalization, the food that would be staying in those countries would also be safer. Um, what's not in the report, which I found really interesting, is uh, a dollar sign. Um, you can read through the entire report and there's no dollar amount anywhere. On the first page of the report, it says that the ability to implement this plan is based on resources. And as we all know, FDA doesn't have very many yeah. right now. Let's look at the resource tank. <laughs> I, I think it's pretty empty uh, yeah. right now, like everything else in this town. Um, uh, it's, it's a good idea. There are a lot of things that they talk about here that I think have their start other places. Um, they want to you know, enhance the ability to, to do lab tests and to um, make sure the technology is all up to par, but it's not real clear exactly how this is gonna happen if nobody has money. Right. As I recall in our article, there are some indications that they address the financial limitations by some of the ideas that they offer. There's some discussion about public-private partnerships. Um, one of the big things they talk about in the plan is um, like with lab capacity, being able to know or, or having available for other countries a list of tests that they could do for, to test for pathogens, what have you, that, they will, that these countries will know FDA will accept. There is a laboratory up in uh, Maryland that is a, is a sort of a, a train-the-trainer lab. They work almost exclusively with helping other countries have the same lab capabilities. Talking about that GIFSAN. The GIFSAN lab, yes. Yeah. Um, Jessica, how are other countries and food companies in other countries reacting to this? Or well, the general concept yes, of the, U, the FDA getting involved in foreign capacity building. Well, one thing that you need to be clear on is that uh, FDA already does um, uh, technical assistance, capacity building, and really USDA does it too through USAID and even in the area of food safety um, prior to the Food Safety Modernization Act. Um, for example, um, I know I have a friend that used to work at USTR, is in Vietnam, and has uh, brought FDA folks over there, um, paid for by um, the U.S. government. So in some ways this report uh, reviews or encapsulates what they're already doing, but the um, Section 305 of the Food Safety Modernization Act, which is Congress's uh, mandate to them to write this report, uh, does push them an extra way. And since it's part of the Food Safety Modernization Act, obviously it uh, needs to fit into the goals of the Food Safety Modernization Act. As you said, um, and as Mike Taylor says every time he talks about um, FISMA, which is the buzzword for Food Safety Modernization Act, um, he talks, he says that the import piece is perhaps the most uh, biggest area of reform of the Food Safety Modernization Act. If you're um, on the receiving end of this as an exporter to the U.S., you're obviously very concerned about how you're going to meet these new stricter um, market access requirements, food safety requirements. Um, and so there's a lot of concern on the part of the, the foreign uh, companies and governments um, about how they're going to meet these we, uh, new requirements. We've, we've talked about some of the other provisions in FSMA that deal with imports. Um, 
the foreign supplier verification program, mm -hmm. the uh, VQIP, mm -hmm. Voluntary Qualified Importer Program. Exactly. I should have gone there unless I add it down. Right? <laughs> um, uh, those, are, those are very aggressive programs. Um, do you get the sense from the people that you talk to who represent other countries that they're embracing these ideas? Or do you get the sense that they're a little bit irritated? Well, they're, I would say, confused, including the domestic folks to some extent. Um, as you know, uh, FDA is way behind on um, actually meeting the deadlines for putting forth the regulations. They have put forward in proposed form the regs on preventive controls and produce safety, which are really establishing the standards domestically. But those will also be the standards that will be implied, applied to the um, uh, foreign uh, exporters to the U.S. Um, but exactly how that will work is unclear until these, the other two regulations, the one being um, foreign supplier verification program and then the very critical piece is a regulation that will be uh, set out the rules for uh, FDA's accreditation of um, third-party auditors so that that um, avenue can be used. And that kind of goes to the budget issue again. That's a way that um, FDA could potentially uh, have more oversight over the foreign supply chain without actually going and um, inspecting uh, at each point in the supply chain, but they would rather rely on accredited auditors to right. do that. But um, And that program would allow foreign governments to act as the third party. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, uh, but it is true that the uh, new law is aggressive, as you say, um, particularly on the importer. The importer is essentially going to have to police the supply chain, and that um, is a U.S. entity, but it really is the foreign supply chain that's going to have to do it and pay for it and, um, and so on. So there's a tremendous amount of concern out there about this. Um, and some consternation over the fact that, uh, especially I would say from the more developed countries, robust um, OECD countries, because they have their own food safety systems, and so their attitude is, um, our food supply, our system is just as good as yours. Why do we have to um, change ours or tweak ours in order to meet your uh, new standard? Right. Mm -hmm. We sat down with John Daly when he was still the DG Sanko for Europe. Last June. Last June, and we yeah. asked him about some of the things that were happening with yeah. Fishman. His reaction was, <laughs> His reaction hey. was, we're good. We already work with yeah. you. We're, all right. you know, we're, we're the European Union. We're wonderful. Why don't should a, we have don't to? Expect, <laughs> don't expect us to start doing right. all kinds of uh, things to yeah, he, catch he, up on this. He really felt that since we're already, you know, we're, we're so close with them as it is, we, we shouldn't, they shouldn't have to, you know, submit to extra, extra inspections, extra, extra Does testing. the capacity plan at all delineate between the different countries in terms of, you know, some countries may be further along than others, or does it sort of have a blanket approach and assumes that everybody's got to meet standards in sort of the well, same way? on its face it has a blanket approach, except for um, in one instance it does say that the FDA commissioner can um, really, with a lot of words in the statute, but essentially total discretion, decide that any product or any country, they can add another layer of certification. And it's clear that those would be um, pretty obviously, even though it doesn't name them, be the poor, least developed countries, yeah. because they're the ones that are not going to have uh, the robust um, food safety systems already in place. And again, not um, explicitly in the statute, but in response to it fairly recently, mm, two years ago, but after the law came out, uh, FDA went down this track of comparability, which is kind of they never wanted to use the word equivalence and don't, don't want it to be thought well, of as exactly like FSIS. But those countries that they worked with were New Zealand and the European Union mm -hmm. in order as a pilot. But this right. made the poorer countries, or to the extent that they knew what was going on, uh, very anxious because they started to see that there would be two systems. One, the wealthier countries would get their systems um, declared as comparable and would not have to do much more, mm -hmm. and that would leave uh, you know, could really change market shares on uh, imports and so forth. So, and I think VQIP has a role to play there as well in the fact that you know, if you're established or if you if you're coming, if you have a product that's coming from something that's vault that's qualified that you know, can prove that they can do better. Going through the extensive process they can go of faster. VQIP, you're in. You're in. You can go. Yeah. You know, your product comes into the U.S. quicker. There was some conversation early on uh, when we were uh, covering this initially about comparability versus 
equivalency. And let's see if I have the, the difference. My understanding of is equivalency is you're focused on individual products. Um, uh, lamb from New Zealand. Mm -hmm. um, whereas comparability is a broader approach. You're looking at the country as a whole. Uh, am I right? More or less, the thing about equivalence is very spelled out and has a long history, and this comparability is something they just started um, talking about. So it's uh, not maybe entirely clear that very question about whether it's a product um, or the whole system. It, Everyone assumed it was the whole system, and with New Zealand, the pilot was the whole system. The pilot with the EU was actually one product, yeah. and so that's still kind of up for grabs whether it could be one or the other. But um, it's a little bit lighter than equivalence. They wouldn't, you know, in equivalence, there's a inspector, um, a plant by plant inspection, and even after you get the um, equivalence determination, you still have a plant by plant approval and so forth. So it's the idea is that it would be uh, less prescriptive, really. Okay. But uh, um, and the, th the thing is, though, that uh, I think they were hoping that it would be something. A lot of the criticism of the equivalence is it takes years sometimes mm -hmm. to get it. Yeah. And uh, however, the New Zealand pilot, you know, and think the size of New Zealand and the um, that it is very um, advanced system still took them more than a year to mm -hmm. even compare documents and so forth. So I think that you know FDA has really bitten off um, oh, yeah. as much as it can <laughs> chew, and I think yeah. it's maybe given up on that approach temporarily yeah. anyway. Mm. Um, uh, so, but that's not going to solve the problem that I think that concerns me personally, which is the uh, poorer countries that have, you know, especially in areas uh, like produce, you know, a lot of um, Central American, small Central American countries and um, rely on exporting those products to this market. It would be um, really unfortunate if they got pushed out because of not being able to have the standards that um, the U.S. is demanding. Now I want to, we're running out of time, but I want to mm -hmm. ask you for one final thought. And if you could very quickly summarize this, how do you think this is going to play out? Um, the, well, I think when you say it, this um, technical assistance, I think that it's just going to putter along the way there has been technical assistance. They'll keep trying to um, do as much as they can, but there just aren't many resources. It's very expensive to go mm -hmm. and, um, I mean, technical assistance is a wide range of things. They can still, at a low cost probably, um, educate through webinars and so forth about the U.S. standard, but to really travel abroad and really help other countries stand up a system, I just don't think that's going to happen. And I think there's going to be more and more um, political and economic uh, tension over uh, the impact of this on the you know, SME small companies and especially those in poorer countries. And as a broader foreign policy um, goal of the U.S., you know, we've had USAID and foreign assistance and yeah. really helping these countries to, in just these areas, in the area of food. So I think that, uh, you know, over the long term, there have to be some sort of compromises. Uh, I can say one thing. This is going to keep us, you, and <laughs> us very busy. Very. <laughs> so that's it. We're out of time. Thanks to Jessica and Amber for being with us today. Mm -hmm.